So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to Enabling Hosted IaaS Clouds for Service Providers. My name is John Ballard. I'm a Principal Program Manager on the System Center team. And for the next 75 minutes, I'm going to give you a tour of what we've been doing with the System Center product to allow a wide variety of service providers to essentially begin to offer these self-service hosted IaaS experiences. This session is structured in uh, roughly two parts, not necessarily equally weighted. Uh, in the beginning, I'm going to start off by telling you a little bit about the changes we've made to Virtual Machine Manager to, to essentially take us to this new world of multi-tenant hosted environments. And then for the second half, roughly, of the talk today, I will provide an overview of this thing we call the Server Service Provider Foundation, which is um, an API that we've built to allow programmatic access to some of the capabilities we're building in System Center. And this is specifically intended to allow existing assets that people have to start to get complementary value out of System Center in a fairly lightweight way. And I'll talk more about that as we go. Um, hopefully, the work that we're doing is broad in appeal. We, we, we like to believe that when we make investments for a service provider, it doesn't necessarily matter whether that service provider is facing public consumer type of infrastructure as a service customers, or whether it's an internal customer base in the case of an enterprise. So ultimately, regardless of the fact that the scenarios are quite different and the isolation requirements and all those things are, again, different, uh, the themes that you see tend to replay themselves over and over again. So we'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit about that, too. Um, as I mentioned, the, one of the main goals by building the interface that we've provided on this stuff is to make it easy to start beginning to adopt this in a, in a sort of test the water before you dive into the deep end kind of thing. And, and you'll see how, what I mean by that as we go, uh, go forward. I'll start by talking about Virtual Machine Manager and some of the investments we've made there to get us ready for this brave new world. Um, quickly to recap, uh, about a year ago, we were actually announcing the launch of 2012 at, at this show last year, and I think most of you probably remember that. Um, at that time, we were sort of pulling together all the investments of System Center into, into a more cohesive whole, and there's some things that, uh, some licensing implications, for example, that you've seen of that. But, but at the same time, it allowed us to address sort of our ongoing missions that we think of every time we go to turn out a release of the product. And it starts with very obvious things at the infrastructure level around how we, how we perform. So as an example, high, highly available VMM servers are something that we needed to add because people were asking for that for quite a while, and so that was an important investment for us. Things like PowerShell exposure of the capabilities of the product. We, in the 2012 release, spent a lot of time making sure that everything that you could do with Virtual Machine Manager had some PowerShell exposure to allow uh, the broad community of scripting to, to more effectively use what we had. We also wanted to um, enhance our abilities around how we manage fabric, and so we put some investments in there around um, you know, service life cycle and, and being able to deal with multi -hyper, multiple hypervisors and that kind of thing. The, probably the most important thing for this particular talk is the stuff we did around cloud enablement. So we, we for the first time, uh, instantiated this abstraction called cloud, and we went, around, we went about using it as a way to encapsulate capacity and capabilities. And I'll talk more about that in a minute as well. But then, essentially abstracting away for the consumers of the cloud the physical underlying har hardware. And, and, and really allowing them to focus on what they get and how much they can have of that thing. And then finally, we did some things around service templates. Obviously, we wanted to make it very easy for people to continue to build more complex application descriptions and templatize those things. I won't spend a lot more time on this because I think most of you by now have had a chance to take a cut at 2012 since it's been out in market for a while. Um, after the, actually at the last MMS last year, we were already in the process of working on Service Pack 1. And there have been a lot of different kinds of descriptions of Service Pack 1. One of the most uh, kind of cliched descriptions of it, I think, is when people said, this is not your father's or your mother's Service Pack. And it's kind of a, it's kind of a historical fact at Microsoft that Service Packs were traditionally supposed to be about QFE and bug fix roll-ups. And in this particular case, we put a ton of new functionality into Service Pack 1, and it was all intended to basically do two things. One, get us more ready for this multi-tenant hosted environment, and also keep up with the capabilities of Windows Server that were evolving underneath us. 
And again, like you could almost draw these in a stack. I think the, the number one job that we always face when we kick off a new release is to focus on, on kind of performance aspects or infrastructure, however you choose to describe that. Um, we wanted to be able to obviously go to a greater level of scale. So you know, regardless of what our scale point ever is for VMM server, we will always have people that want us to scale more. And so we will, you could kind of think of that as a, as a perpetual mission for us. And in, this, in the case of Service Pack 1, we now, in theory anyway, and we've got um, proof points for this, that we can support up to 1,000 hosts and 25,000 VMs, which is quite, a, quite an improvement over the previous release. Um, we also had a ton of work to do around performance. And just as an example of some things that, that we had as issues, the, the VMM console would sometimes take minutes to load. And we, in addition to knowing that this was bad for our own usage, we got a lot of uh, overwhelming, you might even say, amount of feedback from people saying, hey, this is unacceptable. What can you do about this? And so we, we did a bunch of smart things inside the console. We, we now lazy load the information as opposed to going and pulling in everything that that is under management before we can actually paint the UI. And then, kind of in a related fashion, we want to make sure that latency is, is always being reduced. So, you know, if you do something in PowerShell, it shouldn't take five minutes for that to show up in the console. So investments we made in Service Pack 1 have, have greatly shrunk, in some, in some cases down to near zero, sub-second even, the effect of running a PowerShell command and, and having some change reflect that in the console. Hey, just, uh, just really quickly, show of hands, how many of you are using 2012 Service Pack 1? Oh, OK, that's good. That's at least half. Great. At the Windows Server level, obviously, we had a lot of things we needed to keep up with, large VMs and live migration enhancements. And so we, you know, you could, again, think of this as more or less a consistent theme for any release we might undertake. We will always be looking to do more performance, and we will always have to keep up with Windows Server. And in fact, we now have a um, synchronized release with Windows Server. So you'll always see S Windows Server and System Center come out together. And every time the Windows Server picks up new capabilities around virtualization, System Center will bring complementary management capabilities for that. Um, net network virtualization is a fairly big deal. And in fact, in, in 2012, in, in Windows Server 2012 and in System Center 2012 SP1, we now have what you might consider sophisticated uh, network virtualization. And, and it's, a, it's a deep topic in itself. We're not going to go into necessarily network or storage in this session. There are, there are breakouts specific to those. And if you guys have uh, PhD level questions on that stuff, I can always find the right person to hook you up with, because all those guys are here at the conference with me this week. We also put some effort into making sure that our partners had um, ways to hook into what we were building and, and a viable go-to-market for them. Um, an example of which would be the UI add-in capability that we've done. So now partners can create UI plugins to the console that are actually a little smarter, and they can even be context aware. And so there's some nice things we did for allowing people to plug in management packs that have corresponding UI add-ins and a bunch of other things. And then finally, multi-tenancy. This, again, is probably the one of these four that is most relevant to this talk, the, the whole thing around getting Virtual Machine Manager out of its enterprise upbringings and into being able to at least think about multiple tenants was an important step for us to make. Doesn't mean we can't continue to do what we've always done well. We can just think of this as an additional value add for those people that have to start thinking about tenants, tenants in a different kind of way. Even at the enterprise level, the departmental separation requirements are going up all the time. And, and, and so these, again, these investments, even though they might seem like they're targeted at public consumer IaaS, they, they again have benefit to our enterprise customer base as well. OK. So I'm gonna, what I'm going to walk you through now is how we think about the workflow related to taking essentially hardware and reducing, or, uh, sorry, and, and exposing that, if you will, to self-service users who consume it. And I, I'll probably hit on this a couple of times because I have a couple different manifestations of this. But the first step is to take literally the physical hardware and set it up. And you can think of this as racking servers. But then beyond that, it's also setting, you know, figuring out what your networking topology is, allocating storage devices, and then determining how those storage spaces project through in terms of their capabilities offered. So you could kind of think of it as taking the, database, uh, the data center and chopping it up into, into the, the pieces that make it all work. Then the next step on top of that would be to then take those compute networking and storage capabilities and abstract them into these clouds that are the basis of tenants interacting with 
with the infrastructure. Once that's done, there's a delegation that takes place. Now, whether that goes straight to the end user or to some intermediary, we'll, there are a couple different examples, and we'll talk about those in a second here. But now you've got some clouds. You want to delegate that out to a self-service user. And then finally, that self-service user um, takes the ca capacity that's been made available to them, and they start consuming virtual machines for um, a bunch of different application purposes. And in fact, as a shorthand, we often call this user, either the self-service user or the application owner. You could kind of think of them in a loose sense as their own form of administrator for the VMs that they control. So now when you think about private clouds, there's, there's essentially two views onto it. There's the, the provider view, who's looking at it from the hardware up, if you will, and then there's a the consumer who's coming in in terms of just what are their application needs and then what abstractions have been, avail been made available to them. Uh, for the provider, at the compute level, you have the hosts and, and the clusters and the library shares and all the stuff that they think of in terms of how the compute is managed. When that stuff projects up to the end user, there's a more kind of an abstract perspective on that, which is all about the capacity and capabilities. And in fact, now I'm going to talk about capacity and capabilities all the way across the consumer's perspective, because that's consistently how they think about it, regardless of what the physical manifestation might be. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the networking space, you again, you have, you have these, the physicality of networking, the logical networks and the underlying address pools and such that, that make that stuff work. As, that, as those networking services project up into the consumer space, they think more about the virtual networks that they consume and how they'll do load balancing and such across networked services. The logical networks are a fairly interesting piece here because even though they're more of a the provider's concept, really, they show through to the consumer in some cases because of this new role that we'll talk about in a second where essentially a consumer can create networks. And when they're creating virtual networks, they have to have some basis in a, in a logical network. And so that's kind of why logical networks can show through to them. I'll talk more about that in a second as well. And then storage kind of has the same thing. You have, again, the pools and the, the arrays and such, and then those project up as classifications available to the consumer. So I talked already about how we think of the cloud as nothing more than an abstraction of compute networking and storage in, in, to make it easy to consume, essentially. Um, the capacity is described in the dimensions that you see listed here. There's, there's really five of them. There's only five of them. And in fact, you could sort of ignore custom quota at the bottom. It's, it's there for legacy purposes at this point. Uh, essentially, CPUs, memory, storage, and networking. And, um, uh, sorry, number of VMs. And um, the, the capacity that's described will, there's a bunch of different ways you can control this. So you have different users that you can define. And you can expose the capacity to individual users, to groups of users, to tenants. And there's a, there's a fairly sophisticated mapping that can take place under the covers. And so everything is, again, anchored to what capacity does someone have access to? And that, that is dictated by who they are and what membership they, they have in user roles in VMM. One thing that's uh, sort of important to remember here um, is that in the process of taking a, physical, a physicality like networking, compute, and storage and projecting it up into a virtualized world, we essentially begin to be able to consistently overstate what we have available. Or I guess misstate might even be better. You know, typically, nobody's going to understate the capacity that they're able to offer to somebody, necessarily. Um, it's much more common that people will overstate that. So as an example, I might only have 10 terabytes of storage physically. But in terms of the offers that I'm making available to my cloud consumers, I could potentially let them each have 10 terabytes, and I could have 100 of those people. And so it's my job as the, as the administrator of this environment to know that I've essentially overpromised and to manage that. And typically, the management of that is is a, is a monitoring-based thing, right? So you'd, you could imagine if you've got a certain amount of what you might think of as a promise out there, you have to constantly monitor the physical world to make sure that when you get to within 80, 90 percent of your physical capacity, you go and allocate more physical capacity and bring it in, so that you're constantly staying ahead of that, of that overstatement. The other aspect of the cloud, as I mentioned, is the capabilities. It's not just how much of something, but what are the things that I have access to. Um, and in this case, 
the cloud can essentially describe different kinds of VMs and their characteristics and their templates, and then there's all kinds of different shape limits that we can offer in terms of how different machines are described. Um, and as you probably know, since most of you are most likely sophisticated VMM users at this point, the, the, um, the profiles or these shape limits, if you will, are, are really, they can be custom edited to be whatever you want. And I think the out of box, we, we, I think we ship three of them or something, small, medium, large. Um, let's see. Yeah. I'll go ahead and move on. All right, so now we kind of get into the crux of what we did that really enables this multi tenancy to work, and it's around user profiles. Um, we, had, we had essentially three user roles that we, that we had in VMM up until SP1. Uh, two, actually, a couple kinds of admins the, the, the sort of data center admin who has access to everything. The scoped admin, who has uh, essentially some narrow set of hosts or whatever that they manage. And then there was this read-only administrator that was, um, it was intended to satisfy some scenarios that we'd tracked for a while. And actually, we still maintain it because it's, it's a valid role in some cases, but it's not widely used. And then at the bottom of that, there's a self-service user who is, again, consuming the VMs that run in this environment. What we did in SP1 was introduce this tenant administrator. And again, the best way to think of this is as a self-service user who has a, just a little bit of administrative capability, and specifically around virtual networks. And I'll, when I get into the demo in a second here, I will show you how some of this manifests in the, in the console. Um, the idea, though, is that, again, thinking about that workflow I described earlier, you have, you have admins creating the, the fabric and getting it ready and creating the clouds. and then they want to pass it off to a tenant administrator who then worries about the details of the consumers in that tenancy. So whether that's an enterprise that comes in and the tenant admin might create departmental and even below that uh, user access. Um, in, the case of, in the case of a consumer hosted experience, it's going to be very similar. There's going to be some tenancy who signs up and says, I want to get 100 VMs and then inside them, their own operation, they'll turn around and dice up that 100 VMs and create sets of networks and groupings of services and things that their self-service users access. So this tenant administrator is a new role and I'll show you how it gets put together in a second. It really, when you create a user role, a tenant administrator user role, about the only difference that you really see is the, you get to set quotas around how they can create virtual networks. This is a little bit of a recap of what I've already talked about, but you have sort of the physical world at the bottom and how that projects up to the consumers. And you can see that we've slid the tenant admin in there between what used to be a fairly wide gulf between the, the data center admin and the, and the app owner or the app admin. Um, I won't spend a lot of time rehashing the concepts here. It's just kind of a nice view, to, another way to look at kind of two or three of the slides I've shown in, in, a, in a consolidated view. All right. So um, the whole goal here is to create self-service environments that keep, that essentially protect the self-service user. And the way you do that is by setting quotas and limit what they can, what they can control. It, obviously, they may always want more quota, and that's an easy thing to solve. You just give it to them more, and you potentially hit them with a usage-based charge or whatever. But the idea here is that um, the quotas can provide, more than anything else, isolation. Quotas provide you know, limits on how much they can do, but then the permitted actions will determine who can touch what. So for example, um, an administrator can see every single virtual machine in the environment. A tenant can only see those VMs that have been created within their tenancy. And a self-service user could even be narrow, more narrowly scoped than that, so that they can maybe only see the VMs that they're the owner of, and they sit right next to somebody else who has a different set of VMs that they don't even know about. And the whole intent of this is to allow you to take actions on the stuff you care about and not perturb other people's stuff. And it kind of um, it, it leverages this, this user role ability to set quotas in a couple of different ways at the group level and at the, at the individual level. And, and with that, you can essentially get very granular and fine-tuned in terms of how you let people have access to what. One of the other things that's kind of a cool feature is this ability where application owners can share things. And so you can envision a tenant administrator creating two different self-service users that don't really see each other's stuff necessarily, but they can, if they want to, share templates and things across that isolation boundary. And that gives them, um, 
you know, that, that, that sort of builds the community environment without necessarily creating a, sort of a loss of isolation, which might be critical. All right, now we're going to get into, this is a setup for the demo I'm about to do. We're going to talk about how we proxy identity. <clears throat> Excuse me. When we were looking at how we might deal with large volumes of self-service users hitting VMM to do different things with infrastructure as a service, one of the things that we were worried about, frankly, is this um, sort of onslaught of connections into our server. You can imagine if every single self-service user that came at us opened up a unique connection to VMM, it might overwhelm the server. And that was, again, with performance always at the top of our minds, um, thanks to you all making sure that we remember. Um, we, we knew that we needed to come up with a better way. And so one of, what we decided on was this model where we would, we call it on behalf of, and it's a model where we would allow a single connection to occur at, with an administrative set of credentials. So in essence, this connection is now opened with an authentication of an admin service or service account. Within that, however, this, now this single connection can do delegated requests of the back end and, and do things on behalf of somebody else. And so effectively now, by opening a single connection, I can service hundreds or more users coming in through that connection and as long as I delegate their identity when I ask the VMM to go do something. And, it, and it's pretty fine-tuned. Again, it, it leverages all of the, the user role and quota separation I talked about a minute ago. Um, <clears throat> and I'll actually have some PowerShell here in a second to walk you guys through. It'll show you how this works. Uh, and I, think, I don't think anybody was worried about having PowerShell. This is a 300-level session. Sorry, make sure that doesn't time out. All right, so let's get into that. When you open up a connection, you have to essentially tell VMM that you're going to start talking to it in on behalf of mode. And I, I, by the way, has anybody played around with this stuff? Can I see a show of hands who's got on be Oh, good, okay, so this is not completely review for all of you. Um, the, uh, the connection is opened up, and now VMM is expecting that the next several things I do to it will either be for myself as the administrator, or when specified, I will be issuing calls on behalf of someone else. You can take any role that's defined in VMM and use that as the context under which you're going to be talking to VMM and asking it to do things. And obviously, as sophisticated as the roles can be, you can have a wide variety of how this will project into this, into this on behalf of behavior. When you, um, when you talk to VMM on behalf of somebody, you have to tell it two things. What user role is that? Um, what user role is being played by the person you're proxying for, and who are they? And the, an example here, you see I have uh, john at contoso.com. Now, this is really nothing more than a string. Um, we don't use it for anything. Remember, we have now assumed that authentication has occurred, and all we're going to do is make sure that whoever is asking for something is authorized to do the action that they're asking to do. And so we've, we've taken the, the auth n, auth z problem and split it, and we've left authentication to the portal writer, and now we, we do the authentication of what the requested action is. And in this case, john at contoso.com, again, is, is just an identity. It could be anything. It could be a Facebook ID. We don't really know. We just store it. And that way, in the audit, in the job log, and everything else in VMM, you will see that this action, this VMM was stopped on behalf of so-and-so, and that's the demo I'll get to in a second here. And it actually goes just like that. In this particular case, I will issue a stop command to a VMM, or to a VM, rather, and then it'll do it on behalf of me. And then when you go look at the job, you'll see that. So let me hop over and see if we can make this work. We had a, we've had network issues. I don't know if you guys have heard about this or not, but um, somebody gave a demo earlier today. One of our executives was demoing, and I, I was told that they they had to create a cell phone hotspot to get back into CorpNet to get to their demo environment. So fingers crossed that this stuff all continues to work. All right. Um, yeah. So actually, really quickly, I'm going I'm to take you in and show you the, um, the new user role, just in case you haven't seen it. If you go into Settings and you create a user role, name it something like Demo Test. You'll see that we have tenant administrator here now. And, and I don't know if you noticed that, but when I clicked on tenant administrator, watch on the left side, and you'll see network, networking pops in there. 
And that's, again, the way that you can determine how much, how many networks this tenant administrator could create, essentially. I can get, uh, if I can get down to it real quick here if you want to see that. I'll skip that. I'll pick a cloud. By the way, one thing I didn't actually mention in clouds, I, I talked to you about how I think of, or how we, I guess, think of clouds as an abstraction of capability and capacity. You could more generally call those capability and capacity that together they, they boil down to quality of service. And so one of the things you'll see when you look at our demos and other material that will be that we tend to name our clouds things that look like uh, mileage plus plan names or something, gold, silver, bronze, or alpha, beta, omega, whatever. We, we, we like to think of clouds as an encapsulation of quality of service, and so I kind of want to drive that theme home. It's absolutely true that people will create clouds for all kinds of things. I could envision having a giant enterprise customer, you know, a Coca-Cola cloud. But realistically, cloud isn't about isolation. It's about the quality of the hardware that it's abstracting away. There are other mechanisms for isolation, I guess, is the main point. Yes. Back to, sure, right there. Yes. So your question is, what, how do storage classifications show up here? Mm -hmm. This is, uh, yeah, I'm just creating a user role right now. You can restrict their access to those resources, yes. Um, most of what you do here, at the user role level, most of this is about the quoting system. The access is controlled in another place. So you, you know, the, um, see the actions and resources? That's where you get to that. So if you go ahead a little bit, I didn't necessarily plan to demo this too much, but this is where you can add different kinds of resources. Um, this is templates and things, but, but essentially you can, you know, why don't we, I tell you what, would you mind if we took that as, a, as an offline question after the thing? I don't want to get too far down a rat hole here on the creation of the user role. The main purpose of this, again, is to give you a way to primarily pull together a user role that says, here are the things I can access, and here's how much of those things. And you could kind of try to simplify it to that in your mind. I'll go ahead and cancel out of that. If I go back to VMM, or sorry, the VMs that I have running here, you can see I have a, a few VMs here. And these have actually, the, the one I've highlighted here, let's see, I don't know if you can see that. I think you can. I've, I've created a VM myself using the console. I gave access to this user role to this particular VM. Now, in theory, that means that the, that the user should have access to it to take actions on it. So I'm going to pop out to um, PowerShell. Open that up. And I've got... Um, I've got the same PowerShell commands that I just showed you in slide material a minute ago. I'm going to save time typing and just kind of copy paste some of these things. So the first thing that I do is I tell VMM that I'm opening up a connection to do on behalf of commands. And as long as I get a positive response, I know that I'm ready to go. Next step is to pull in the user role that I'll be using in the context of what I'm about to try to do. That's fairly straightforward. Uh, let's see here. I actually wanted to do... I go ahead and do this too, actually. Go ahead and get that over with. This sets up the access to the VM that I'm going to try to stop in a minute here. Okay, now I wanted to show you the difference. I've got a connection open to VMM, and it's, it's listening to me, knowing that I might issue commands on behalf of someone. If you look at what I've highlighted here, I'm asking for a, <clears throat> in a formatted table, bring back to me the VMMs, or the VMs, rather, that you know about. 
And because I don't have any on behalf of flag here, it's going to tell me everything that the administrator is allowed to see. So if I copy that over, and you'll see that I have three VMs there. And if you look at the console, those same VMs right there. Okay. So now if I do that same command, but I instead do it with the context of and on behalf of proxy, I should get a different set because John at Contoso.com in the, in the user role tenant self-service user does not have access to everything. And sure enough, what I get back is a scoped result specific to me. And you can be, you can be um, again, fairly sophisticated here. I can, in the same way that, that I can't see all of what the administrator can see, if I was a tenant admin and I had self-service users underneath me, they can be isolated in the same way. Okay. And, all right. So that's on behalf of, and again, it sets up the, it kind of sets the stage for what we then go on to do with Service Provider Foundation to allow programmatic access to these capabilities and, and let people create these multi-tenant environments. So let me jump back over to slides for a minute. So that was a demo we just did. <laughs> All right, now let's talk about Service Provider Foundation. Uh, quick show of hands, who is read about or used? I'll give you, a, you know, a, so SPF. Do you got SPF users in the room? That's not bad, maybe 25% being generous. Um, okay, as I, as I mentioned, this is an investment we made in the, in the Service Pack 1. It was, it's, it was new. And it was, it was intended to allow lightweight API access to what, essentially, what I just showed you in VMM. But more than that, too. It's got a, it's got a bigger future than that, but we'll, uh, we'll leave that for later. All right. This is really nothing more than a sideways representation with a little bit more detail of the workflow that I talked about a bit ago, where I said that, you know, you think about someone taking the data center, carving it up, creating, then creating clouds as an abstraction as the first point to having tenants then interact with it, and then having some delegated administrator that can essentially provision for self-service users. By the way, I think it's important to note that although we talk about this particular workflow a lot, it's going to be a little bit different for everybody. I mean, I don't think, you know, it would be pretty hard to come up with the canonical workflow. I just think this is kind of a nice typical way. And it's a, it's a simplified way to think about it, and that's kind of why we use it for this. Um, when we, when we set out to build SPF, we, it was kind of the result of a bunch of feedback that we'd been getting around how people wanted to use System Center. Um, you know, multi-tenancy had, had an effect on VMM, but then we had to have a way to, again, programmatically access that stuff. And, and people up to that point were writing a lot of PowerShell, and demand PowerShell generated by code in some cases. But um, so more of a design style that would be compatible with the way people are building modern web applications and portals. Um, there were also a lot of investments that people wanted to maintain, right? So if we came out with an API that didn't allow an easy way to hook into it, we would, we would cause people, ma in some cases, massive rewrites of their, of their assets, and we didn't want to do that. Um, we wanted to expose the virtualized network capabilities that were coming up, and that was important to us as well. So we had a bunch of different kinds of things we were trying to do all in one, all in one shot. Um, in many ways, I think of this whole theme as being about uh, helping the service provider expose what might be considered the commodity actions that take place in their infrastructure as a service environment. In other words, if, if an administrator prior to last year, let's say, if that administrator was spending 50% of their time doing nothing but managing virtual networks, then, then the highest calling we can think of is to come up with a way to allow them to ultimately delegate that out to the end users, to, to, to allow them to take that 50%, dial that down to 10%, and then spend that recovered cost on doing things that sort of competitively differentiate. Kind of an overriding theme that I like to think of anyway. All right, so one way to look at what we did was, again, as a stack, you could always think of us as, as consistently trying to project from the bottom up. So Windows Server develops some cool new features around virtualization or networking or whatever. It's System Center's job to expose that stuff. And then through, 
through, a, through an investment like Service Provider Foundation, we allow hosters to, or service providers in a more generic sense to pick up those capabilities. And, and I kind of think of it as a progression a little bit, um, starting with virtual machines. You know, it's by far today still the hottest topic in, in as a service offerings is, is the ability to create virtual machines for whatever purposes. And so as much as there are grander dreams about where as a service can ultimately lead, it's still, we're still kind of in the, in the early days, right? I mean, early days in this case are a decade long. But, but the whole idea is being able to build VMs and use them is, is a valuable thing. Um, it, and then it kind of follows a pro progression. Once you've got virtual machines that you can own and operate in your own, in your own way and, and, and in a very lightweight and easy pay-as-you-go kind of way, the next thing is to create networking between VMs to, to begin to create what amounts to a composite application. And you can kind of think of that then going on and on through services that allow you to describe multi-tiered applications and ultimately lead to some automation, which you could kind of think of as the richest or I guess the highest order of abstraction in terms of a workflow that can sit on top of a bunch of services in this environment. Um, you know, and, and I, I, I kind of out Microsoft a little bit here for this. Sometimes we um, don't necessarily do a crawl, walk, run. If you look at Azure even a little bit, we, we sort of jumped right to platform as a service when it first came out three years ago. And, and only now are we completing the story that has a really good infrastructural offering, which seems to be where everybody's interest continues to be, or at least uh, a lot of it. So um, I may not have explicitly mentioned it yet, but the Service Provider Foundation is built as a web service. It's, it's got a RESTful design pattern, represents, representational state transfer. Um, it, it uses the OData syntax for, for querying against um, structured collections of information. And the reason we pick these things is because this is kind of the hot design style now for modern applications. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about a web application, a mobile app, whatever it is, people want stateless GUI that can talk to the back end in a fairly lightweight way. And so we picked these design points for a reason, and, and, and more so. The OData itself, the syntax of, of OData, the protocol, is sort of this ascendant standard. It's, it's, um, it's been out now for several years. You're starting to see other people support it besides Microsoft, even though we kind of got it going. It shows up in lots of other Microsoft products. I'll do a demo in a second here. I, I don't know if it'll work or not. Actually, I was having trouble with it. Where you can use Excel to talk to a, an OData endpoint and pull back structured data and, into a nice spreadsheet if you want to do that. So there's some kind of cool things around, around client access and the libraries that you can use to, to build portal experiences. Um, one of the, again, one of the big themes of the feedback we'd been getting was that if we provided this in a way that was lightweight enough, people could essentially plug it into what they already had. So you know, if, they had, if they had existing experiences around how to interact with infrastructure as a service, um, this would allow that to occur. Um, and it's also portable. You know, you can have a mobile app that can talk to a RESTful endpoint. Any device that can form a URL can talk to a RESTful OData endpoint. I want to do one quick little uh, primer on this concept called STAMP, because we say it a lot, and I don't necessarily know how well it lands with people. Uh, in a very simple way, a STAMP equals a VMM server. Um, the, the reason to start to think about stamps as something that can get replicated, it, it comes from a manufacturing theme, I think. And the reason to think in those terms is that as you're scaling up your hosted operation, the, the particular limits of VMM in terms of scale at that, at that point in time are not necessarily super relevant. You need to know about them because you don't want to run afoul of your limits, but it's an arbitrary number, and ultimately the consumers that are that are using your services are the ones that are going to dictate how you have to scale. So you don't necessarily want to hit some boundary and then be done. So you could start to think of stamping out new VMM servers every time your need for capacity goes up. And SPF then comes along and provides an aggregation across the top of all of that. So you can see in this particular picture I've drawn two different VMM servers with their own hosts and, and then tenant guest VMs. Um, with SPF providing the ability to interrogate the status of everything across all of that. So in essence, SPF is one way to begin to abstract away the scale that's happening underneath with VMM and, um, and allows you to sort of grow more, uh, more freely, I guess. You could also, in a loose sense, I suppose, think of SPF as the federation service for VMM because 
you know, any given VMM server doesn't know about any other VMM servers, but SPF now knows about them all and can understand, you know, this tenant lives in that one and this tenant lives in that one over there. So it's, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it's valuable for that reason. And again, you can kind of think of SPF as being the way that we start to open up multi-tenancy across a uh, freely scalable environment. Yeah, I got a question back there. Got it. Yeah. So the question is, has to do with how you think about scaling up SPF and how it might choose to direct traffic across a scaled up farm. At its simplest, SPF is nothing more than a web service. So the way you would scale it is very similar to how you would scale a web farm. And, and typically, when you think about highly available and highly scalable SPF, you would, you, you kind of think of two things. You, you need the back end database to be highly available and, and obviously fast. And then you need that web farm to be also highly available in load balance. And so in a sense, you could kind of think of, of, of needing to do two things. From the bottom up, you would create clustered SQL Server to give you nice, highly available database. And then you would have a web farm, you know, 10, 12 IIS servers or whatever, each of them with SPF on it, all talking to that same database. <coughs> and, then, and then use, um, excuse me, and then use load balancing, IIS load balancing across to have a, essentially a single URL delegating to the, to the member to the farm members, you know? And then if one IIS server drops out, no big deal, because the others are there. If a, if a call fails, it's not the end of the world, because again, the, the portal didn't retain any state, the, the call would just fail, the user would get notified, and then you make the call again. Yeah? Yeah, so the, the question has to do with how SPF knows what to talk to. If what, in our SPF database, we track tenancy, and then we know essentially where that tenant lives by virtue of, we, we have a mapping between all of the tenants that we know about and the servers that we have in the back end. Does the, sorry, does the client? No, no, the, the whole goal of this would be to not have anybody at the level of the consumer have to worry about where they live. The, again, yeah, again, that's, that's kind of the idea. As you think about taking the hardware and dicing it up and making it available, creating that cloud abstraction, that's, that's sort of a, an opaque wall that they can't see past, if you will. All right, a slightly different look at the, uh, I always call this the architecture slide. It's, it's sort of a structural representation of what's inside SPF. At the bottom, again, are the underlying VMM servers under management. <clears throat> and then we have at the top the, the different ways that you can come into the, sorry, the different ways that you can invoke SPF. The, um, the web service is essentially a PowerShell web service that, that is in, Excuse me. <clears throat> that does the authentication of the user and then delegates to a set of assets inside SPF that know how to go and execute the command. So when, when a request is made against an object, let's say somebody wants to stop a VM, they, they call stop, you know, stop SC virtual machine, which then we map to an implementation that has the details that actually go talk to VMM. And I'll, I'll kind of show you the details of how this works in a second, but essentially you have a, a set of PowerShell scripts. In Service Pack 1, we shipped a bunch of PowerShell scripts, which I'll show you in a second, that are the implementation of any action that you might take against a managed object in VMM. Uh, and again, we, we store in SPF database those things that are unique to SPF, or that uh, you might, another way to think of that is things that don't get stored anywhere else, except for user roles, which obviously are uh, mapped to the VMM user roles. Yes? Yes. So the, the question is, in this picture, with runbooks and PowerShell scripts as the implementation layer that essentially talks to the servers, 
um, what power do you, as the, either the consumers or the hosters, have to dictate what's in those implementation details? Well, you can actually control some of that. We have, we have ways for you to, to um, modify that stuff. I'll, I'll, actually, I have a slide on this in just a second. I'll talk in detail about how you can, how you can modify some of that stuff. Um, all right. Um, I think this is essentially another represent representation of the same thing. I, the, the only difference being at the, in this particular picture, you see the, the URL that you use to talk to the web service endpoint. Um, and I, I'll do this in my demo in a second, so it's not super uh, uh, necessary that we go deep into this. It's, it's again, it's a list of, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a web service that has a structure that allows us to take a call and map it to a particular action. And we do that through a combined definition of the objects that we know about and the actions that we can take against those objects. And those are in two different places, and I'll show you that in a second as well. I guess right now, in fact. All right. Okay, this is the SPF machine. This machine has been um, set up with SQL Server, uh, one instance of the SPF web service, and it also has the uh, Virtual Machine Manager console installed on it. That's not that we ever expect this console to be used, only that we needed the commandlets of VMM on the SPF box in order for this linkage to work. Um, so I'll take you through a little bit of what we have here, starting with a look at the website or the, um, the IS application itself. So like we talked about, whoop, there we go. SPF is nothing more than a, um, a regular old web service. Again, if you look in IIS Manager, you'll see a site called SPF. And it's got a handful of endpoints associated with it. Let's see if I can do, uh, yeah, there you go. Kind of do this tricky zoom thing. So there's the SPF site and its endpoints. The, I'll, I'll talk really quickly about each of them. The most, um, I guess the most meaty one is the VMM endpoint. This is where tenant actions against virtual machines go. That, that endpoint is intended to be primarily used by tenants. Um, when, ultimately, in the long run, you could kind of think of us as using en web service endpoints as a way to separate traffic, too, so that in, ultimately we want to be able to scale this stuff out. Um, the administrative endpoint is where something will call typically when you're doing something specific to SPF that doesn't go deeper. So as an example, when you add a new VMM server to SPF, SPF again has to know about potentially multiple VMM servers, and so we will go and update our servers table in SPF with, with this new VMM that you've just added for scale reasons. That, the ability to, the, the CRUD operations against that table are in the admin endpoint. Uh, and then this provider endpoint is necessary for a portal that we uh, interop with, and I'll show you that portal in a second here as well. The provider endpoint is just a way for these two APIs to talk to each other, uh, and I'll get into that more in a second. Um, one of the things I do want you to think about is that to date we're not necessarily pure in the way we separate traffic to these web service endpoints. We, as an example, an admin can take actions on a VM, and when he does that, or he or she will be hitting the VMM endpoint, which is primarily intended to be a tenant endpoint. And why you need to know that, or why that, why that would even matter, aside from being a techie, is that um, if, you, if you wanted to do a scaled or a secured deployment topology of some kind, you might want to massively scale up the tenant endpoint, because it's going to get hit by thousands of people, maybe even hundreds concurrently. And it might need to be out some, outside some kind of firewall. Admin, on the other hand, will be inside of the firewall and won't be hit that heavily. You might have, you know, 5, 10, 15 different administrators at any given time. And so this, the scale requirements and where these endpoints live could ultimately in the long run be different. We, I want to tell you that we have not done a good job of separating these endpoints to date. There are ways to achieve what I just described, but you'd have to, I think, work with us directly to get it, to get it right, unless you're, a, unless you're really... Um, sophisticated deployment person, which probably a lot of you are. Okay, so that's the structure of the site. Behind each of these is the stuff I showed you a minute ago, which is the sort of the implementation details. So if you open up the, there's the path right there. If you open up the, um, the site contents and look at what's in there, you'll see a bunch of different stuff. Uh, you can ignore the language files and things that are at the top. Below that, you will see all of these PowerShell scripts. And you can look in any one of them. They, they look like PowerShell. Um, nothing especially exciting here. In fact, this, um, 
Except that you could potentially use this to, uh, to learn more PowerShell if you really felt like you wanted to do a, a deep study on some stuff. What's really interesting here, aside from the scripts that actually do the work, is how we know which script to call. So there, there are two files that ultimately define that for us. This, they're both called subsystem. The first one is a um, managed object framework file, MOF file, that is so subsystem.MOF, and it contains a definition of all the classes that we know about. SPF can essentially take action on any of these objects. And there are the objects that you might expect, user roles, virtual machines, and you can see all the properties associated with these different objects as well. And that's all that is. This thing does nothing more than define the object and the properties that go with it. The other subsystem file that we have, subsystem.xml, is the way that we find the implementation necessary to go do that, whatever the action might be that gets called. And if you look down in here, uh, let's see, I'll just pick something. Sorry, hang on a sec. Class implementations. Trying to look for a good one here. You, the structure is basically the same for all of these, so I guess it's not super critical that I find a, a virtual machine or whatever. Here's a user role. So for, for the user role object, we have a we have a script file called user, sc-userRole2, and this is how you talk to the user role object and do actions, <coughs> excuse me, do actions against that object. And the, the XML here defines not only the relationship between the object and the different actions you can take on it, but also the different fields that get fed into those actions as parameters, so that essentially we can take the call, pull it apart, feed the parameters into the script, and then the thing runs. And then again, all the script files show up here. So that's the structure of the, of the web service. One of the things that people do right when they first install SPF is test it to see if it's alive. And you can do that a number of ways. I actually put out a blog post on this about a month and a half ago. <clears throat> you can go open up Internet Explorer and just hit the web service. And when you do that, it'll report back to you once you ignore the certificate warning, it'll report back to you all the things it knows about the different objects that it can talk about. And they're just, they're nothing more than a list of objects here. You can see those, okay? You can actually then essentially begin to build out the, the structure of an OData query in the same environment. You can actually use the Internet Explorer to do a get on data that's stored in, in VMM. So if I want to narrow this up a little bit, I can say, you know, beyond just talking to that endpoint and knowing what objects are there, I'm going to ask about virtual machines. And so the thing can bring back everything it knows about virtual machines. And I think there's probably three of them here, if I remember right. And it's, it's obviously very verbose, right? There are a ton of properties for any VM, for any VM and, and you get them all back when you ask for that. Now, one way it gets <clears throat> more interesting is when you begin to treat OData as a, as a query language, very similar to T-SQL or anything else, you can... You can select particular parameters. Let me show you this here, if I can get this just right. Okay, you see, right there, you see that I'm selecting out a particular set of properties. I'm not, I'm not saying, give me a VM in every property. I'm asking for these four specifically. And then what I got for that was this set right here. So it reports back to me the properties that I asked for. Now, that same thing can then be taken over into something like Excel and pulled into a workbook. And I can show you how to do that. I don't think it's going to work, though. I've been having a certificate issue that I just cannot seem to get past. So in, in, uh, in Excel, you can obviously bring in data from lots of different sources. If you go to the Data tab, there is a From Other Sources box in here. And one of those is the OData data feed. And at that point, you just... Let's see, I'm, I'm virtually positive this isn't going to work, but I'll try it anyway. Oops, hang on. You take that URL that I just did a minute ago to pull those four properties off the VMs, you copy it in there, and you just paste it right there. And then this is where I'm having trouble. I don't, uh, the authentication has not worked once, but I'll try it. See, it started, it even loaded up. It knew, it, it knew about the tables, but for some reason it's not letting me talk to that endpoint. So 
Anyway, that's the idea. You can essentially any client that can talk to an OData endpoint um, can do what I just showed you. Okay, let's see. I think I got everything. Yep. All right. Let's pop back out to slides for a minute. All right, now there are a, a couple of different kinds of scenarios that, that the SPF will enable once it's deployed. You could think of, again, the same thing that I've talked about a couple of times now, this idea that you'll have multiple VMM servers or stamps and SPF sitting across the top of that and performing, performing some level of aggregation of the information behind. The, um, the endpoint is available to be called a, a couple of different ways, and that's because we have a couple of different authentication models that we use. Um, automation... Um, and, I'll, and I think I'm going to come back to your automation and extension story here in a second. Automation is a way that we can allow essentially a hook into anything else that we, you know, I, I think of this as the get out of jail free card. If there's anything that SPF needs to do that it doesn't inherently, automation is the way to make it happen. And that's only going to be more true as we go. Now, at the same time, we're obviously going to increase what SPF can do, but, but you, can, you can see, we think of automation and integration going together. Yeah, what was your question? Into automation. So, um, so you were, you, your question was around storage. You've got some something that you need to do around storage that SPF doesn't do. Yeah. You, you have two ways to get to that. And if you can, if you hold for just a second, I'll talk about both ways when we, in just a minute. Okay, a couple different tenant scenarios for how to access this stuff. One is where we, I think where we started with SPF was assuming that we had a bunch of service providers that had existing portal assets and they simply wanted a way to hook up what SPF could make available to them. And so we, <clears throat> excuse me, we have, we have the tenant talking to a portal in, the, in an authentication system that already exists. And then at that point, it's, it's sort of a trusted connection over HTTPS based on a, um, essentially a user account password set that SPF knows about, and then the portal can talk to SPF and go do its thing. That's, that's probably the dominant way that we'll see this thing deployed, although there's a, there are a number of other things that are going to be picked up as well. Um, another way that, can, that, a, that a client experience could talk to SPF is by issuing a claim. So, um, you know, let's say, uh, I, I, tend to, I typically call this the app controller scenario just because that's kind of how we've set up the ability for App Controller to talk to SPF. And if anybody's using App Controller, um, you might have um, plans for how you use App Controller. And one way to continue to evolve the use of that asset is by letting it talk to SPF and pick up the new features that we're exposing through the, through the interface. Um, but it's simply, it's a claims base. So you kind of have two paths today to talk to SPF. Basic authentication over HTTPS or claims based present a SAML token and, and make a claim against SPF. Now there's uh, a third way, and I'll get to this in a second. There's this thing called the Azure Services Management Portal and API. It's kind of a mouthful. Um, the more simple name for it is Azure Services on Windows Server. And it has its own API. It's a, it's a portal, and in fact, it's the Azure portal. And it's got essentially the Azure API sitting underneath it. The tenants can talk directly to that API, which also knows how to talk to SPF. So there's a, there's a layering that happens here when you have Windows, System Center, SPF, and then this, this Azure API can sit on top of SPF to talk to System Center. And there's a very good reason for this, and I'll talk about it in a second, but you could, Azure services on Windows Server, there is really no management experience for Azure, and so when you move to Windows Server, System Center has to light up and become that management experience. Just to talk real quickly about how um, authentication works, you know, an admin will access a portal. Self-service user will then go to do some action. The portal then creates a XAML token, which I talked about to, yeah, XAML token, excuse me. And uh, with, the, with the private side of their key to encrypt the token with a claim in it, pass it off to the provider who then will um, take the token, use the public key to, de to decrypt the claim, and then validate. Once we know, once we have a valid user, at that point, then SPF is talking to VMM in SPF's own persona. 
I want to I want to sort of revisit this multi-tenancy and aggregation point because it's fairly important. It's it's one of the key value propositions of SPF. Ultimately, you have you have stamps that are nothing more than the place that clouds live, and ideally, you don't want to have to think too much about the scale unit that makes that happen. You just want to think about the fabric. SPF sits across that stuff. And then you have a, a bunch of different tenants that come in with their own subordinate user roles to access this environment. Now, they, they'll have a lot of different um, needs. In some cases, they'll be departmental based. You know, you might have, you might have a tenant that has an HR user and, an, and a finance user and, a, and an operations user. But just as likely, you might have role based. So you could have development and test and production and and how, how these different users interact with this environment is going to be very specific or at least quite wildly variable depending on who's doing it. Um, but ultimately, you don't want the users to even worry about where they go. When I create a VM as a user, I just want to create a VM and I want it to be fast. And ideally, that means it's somewhere near me physically and it has good networking and all that stuff. I don't care if it's in that VMM over there or that one over there. I really don't. Um, I will care most about quality of service. So again, you could think about me as the user being most interested in, in the abstraction of the cloud that I'm accessing and, and what kinds of capabilities and, and, and what capacity I've been offered. But as these tenants start to subscribe, you get a bunch of crossing. And ultimately, the, the thing that's going to be critical here is that we do our isolation job in the form of some of the, some of the user role separation that I talked about at the beginning of the talk today. What you end up with is a bunch of tenants that share stuff, and they're not even aware that they're doing it. And you don't, again, you don't, want to have to th you don't want them to have to think about where their, where their assets live. And so you end up with this kind of crossing pattern. And, and again, SPF will then come along and provide you the single view, regardless of where the stuff ends up, and provide all the mapping that you need to, to be able to trace down problems and whatever else. All right, now this gets back to you guys' questions about how do I extend. So you saw me a minute ago when I walked you through the, the internals of the SPF interface. Um, you saw me show you all the different files and things that implement SPF. Um, this, this view that you see here is nothing more than the same stack I showed earlier is flipped on its side. And it really just talks about how a call to the interface, once we authenticate the user, we essentially just quickly map to a set of resources, actions, and then the implementation behind that. Now, because of the fact that these things are, you know, I could edit them with Notepad. You saw me open them, and they're editable. So you could, you could change anything you want about SPF, at least in Service Pack 1, and you, can, um, you could start changing those scripts. Uh, I, would, I would definitely recommend you back up a copy if you do that. Um, what we wanted to do, though, was create a way for people to make extensions that didn't necessarily clobber uh, the out-of-box material. And in fact, we also wanted it to be upgrade safe. And so we tried to think about how to put in hooks that would allow people to do that. So uh, one thing that we did, and I say one because we literally did it in one place. We took the create VM method, which is the create action against the VM object. We, we built in a piece of this PowerShell script that knows to go and talk to a table in our database to find out if that particular action has any kind of runbook map to it. And so there's a very simple table in the SPF database. You can imagine that it's, it's nothing more than object, action, and runbook. And if it finds a row in that table for the particular object and action that it's doing, it'll take that runbook and invoke it. And so the idea here was that that would let people essentially build runbooks and do anything that we didn't do. So as on the create VM example, there's all kinds of things that people might want to add. For example, um, you might want to do something really nice and high touch, like send the user an email when the VM finishes creating. Because you know, VM takes 20 minutes, half hour to create. And so you want to, you wanna, they don't want to have to sit there and hit F5. So you want to be able to send them an email. So a great way to do that would be to build a runbook that does nothing more than invoke an SMTP account and fire off an email that says, hey, your runbook's, uh, sorry, your, your email's done. Or your VM has been created, rather. Um, you could kind of more, with more substance, you could also envision somebody doing something like, think of an enterprise that, that says when somebody creates a, a virtual machine, I want to essentially think about that in an IT or policy sense. I want to create a, a ticket. So they'll, they'll use a runbook to go open up a ticket in Service Manager to track the work associated with that VM and, and maybe even do some things specific to the departmental account codes or anything like that. And then more on that business process side, you could envision somebody 
updating an ERP system or a CRM system or whatever else it is. The whole point is that for the actions that we do, we literally just do the necessary action of creating a VM or starting or stopping or whatever. But, but somebody who's running that will have other things they want to do. And so we had to provide a way to hook that in. Now, we didn't, the, the bad news on that particular upgrade safe extensibility point is we didn't apply it to every script. But the good news is you could take that same model and put it wherever you needed it, and the system would at least be smart enough to go check the table and find the run book, and then that would um, essentially give you that extension point that you needed. The more common thing that people are doing, this is, you know, we've been in market for four months or something like that. Certainly our TAP customers and now some of the, some of the um, kind of consuming public are doing this more bulk approach of taking what they think they like in our system and creating a whole copy of it. So you might remember I showed you the VMM folder in the SPF web service uh, IIS site. If you took that folder and copied it and made, a, and made a peer of itself called My VMM, you could essentially then go in there and party onto your heart's content, hack it up, change the, change the mapping, change the objects. You could even, um, you know, you could even Im implement things that we haven't gotten to yet, like, like Data Protection Manager or something. So you could, there's all kinds of things you could do there. If you uninstall the product, everything you've done gets left behind, because that's how MSI works. It'll respect your files. Um, this is by far the safest way to do something. And in fact, it's a really good way to do something, even if you're only tweaking a couple of things. Because again, you're working in a place that's safe. You're not going to wreck the, the base product that, that some other aspect of the product might rely on. Um, so that's kind of a, the way you could think about extensions today. And, and we'll be evolving this as we go. Obviously, the next thing for us to do that would make this much more valuable is to take that defined extension points that are upgrade safe and make it available to every single thing that we can do. Um, so you can kind of envision, envision us doing that in the near future. All right, now I'm going to get into the demoing of this Azure Services on Windows Server. I've got about eight minutes left, um, so I'm going to try to do this fairly quickly. This is the portal that the administrator sees when they're, when they're running what you might think of as private Azure. So Azure on Windows Server, again, is to have a management experience has to be backed by System Center. And this is a portal with its own API. It's kind of a universal service provider model. Anybody that wants to build a service can, can plug it into this. this. This can be downloaded for free off of Microsoft.com. So essentially, you go out and get System Center, you download this stuff, and then you're in business. And it's kind of an, you could kind of think of it as a rapid start or an enabler. When you first come to this experience, what you see is this registration experience. And I'm not going to walk you through it. But it's the way that you can tell this, you can tell this portal, hey, for, for hosted IaaS, talk to System Center through Service Provider Foundation, and you hook up that endpoint. Once you've done that registration, the clouds that have been defined in your environment will show up here. So in the same way that uh, if I go over to the VMM server, you'll see that my, the clouds that I have listed there are also the ones that show up in the portal over here. Now, the, the, the administration experience that we've built to date is fairly, um, fairly basic, but it's, uh, it's, it's powerful, and it does what you need it to do. And I'll show you pretty simply how it works. The whole purpose of the administrative experience, aside from getting some basic things hooked up, is to be able to take offers, bundle them up in this thing called plans. You can think of that as a data plan for your cell phone if you want to. A plan is just an offer bundle. And take the plan and make it available for subscription. Um, when you... When you create a plan, I'll go ahead and create one. I don't know how fast this will go, but um, wait, sorry. I wanna... Sorry, hang on a second. Actually, I'm just going to speed this up because I'm running out of time. I'll show you what's in a plan. A plan can contain, again, any set of offers. This will take a second to load up. Typically, the uh, website needs to wake up when I first touch it. But in this particular plan, um, I've built in two types of service providers, the virtual machine clouds based on System Center, and then there's a SQL Server provider as well. Um, don't think of that as SQL Azure, but roughly analogous to SQL Azure in the long run. There's also a provider that's probably the, the, the most sought after provider that I don't even have here, which is the high density websites. Um, in the same way that you think of websites being available on Azure, when you come into here, you could have websites as part of the plan. So you could offer somebody a um, 
a plan that consists of websites, virtual machines, and SQL Server. Now, one way to think about plans, at the same time that clouds are about quality of service, plans are probably more about workload. So I might have a plan called heavy data analysis plan, and it's got a lot of SQL stuff in it and a whole bunch of storage. So the plans will get tailored along workload lines, at least I think they will. Inside the guts of a plan are the quotas. Let's see if I can. And as a limitation that we have today in Service, in service Pack 1, when you build a plan, you tell it what VMM is going to service that. Now, again, this abstraction takes place so that I'm essentially hooking, I'm creating a plan and I'm hooking it to a VMM and a cloud. When the subscriber subscribes, they don't see the VMM, they just know about the cloud. And there's really not a lot in here that, um, that will surprise you. It's all about what and how much. So you have what things am I making available and what are the quotas. So you see all the different quotas listed here that you might expect to see in VMM. I have templates that I can make available, hardware profiles, networks, et cetera. So now this plan's been created. I already made it public before I came in here. There's this make private, make public toggle at the bottom that lets you create plans, play around with their contents, get them just right, and then expose them when you're ready. Um, the whole purpose of this is, is to enable self-service users to come and sign in. There's, 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 a, there's two aspects to this portal, an administrative experience and a, and a self-service user experience. So what we just saw was the administrator hooking it up, creating the plans. On the self-service user side, it's all about signing up and consuming. The sign-up experience is fairly rudimentary, and I don't think necessarily that you'll see us pour a lot of investment into the sign-up experience for the, for the reason that a lot of hosted IaaS providers already have sort of authentication and sign-up experiences. Um, but as a proof point, when you sign up, you pick which plan you're signing up for, and thereby the subscription that you have gets anchored to a particular plan. I can, I can have 10 subscriptions to, to 10 different plans. I can even have multiple subscriptions to the same plan if I want to. Um, and, I, and I sign up and give it an email and password that I create for myself. I did that earlier, so I'm just going to go ahead and sign in here real quick and show you what that looks like. JBHB.com. And then submit that. When I sign in, it should take me to an environment that lets me operate against the different things that have been made available to me in that plan. And again, this might take a second. Uh, let's let that go. Come on. I, can, I actually, right before I came over here, I did sign in like I'm doing right now and I created this VM right here and you can see that it's got um, it's got that jb at jb.com uh, owner there so um, when I take actions in this portal again they go that goes down all the way through two layers of API talks to VMM which which does the work <laughs> it's a good question does it flow backwards the answer is no well, not in, the answer is not entirely no. It flows backwards for the administrator. If I go into the VMM console and create a new cloud, it immediately shows up in the admin portal. Um, the, anything that a self-service user does is in the context of their subscription, and VMM knows nothing about subscriptions and plans. And so, so in that case, no. Yeah, so that's a good question. When you, when, you do, when you use the portal to take actions against a VMM, what happens, what gets reported in the log? And it, it's, it's very much like you might think any other action that occurs against VMM. So you'll get a job that gets created. It'll show who triggered the job. In the case of, in the case of this portal, it's going to pass that on behalf of identity all the way through. So that's why it said jb at jb.com as the owner of that VM, because I did it in this portal, and that was handed off to VMM in, in an on behalf of way. Okay, so now this thing's come up. It takes just a second longer. And now in this environment, I can create virtual machines based on what was put in that plan. I can quick create the thing, and I'll call it a new VM. And I can pick the template that I made available to myself in that plan, and then I can just pick an administrator password for the, for the VM gets created, and I'm done. Now, 
it'll sit there and do that little green equalizer thing off to the left for a while because a create VM might take 15, 20 minutes to happen. When the VM does get created, there will be a, a callback from VMM all the way back to the portal, and, the, and a status drawer will come up and say your VM has been created. Most likely, people won't sit around and wait for that. They'll go do other things. But yes? So uh, is it possible to use uh, the notation so we can tell users so we can actually react and the, the question, yeah. The, the whole purpose of this investment is to allow us to, kind of in, in the theme of your question, how can I think about one big cloud and have stuff in different places? Yeah, the consistency of how you create the services and how you deploy and manage them, that's kind of the main thing here. You cannot, App Controller cannot talk to the API for this. So, yeah, yeah, there, that's a great point. Mark just brought up that there's a deep dive on this portal and its capabilities. Tomorrow, it's in the afternoon, is it, or is it? Oh, it's 8.30, that's right, yeah, yeah. So I highly recommend doing that. I need to wrap up because we're pretty much out of time here. I wanted to finish one quick thing before I go. And it's a picture of, it's this picture. The whole purpose of this, what you've just seen, is to give you a way to think about consistency across clouds. So whether you're building for a private cloud in, in this Azure server, services on Windows Server, or whether you're actually deploying to Azure itself, the whole point is that the, that the way you do it is fairly consistent. There you go. And again, the, real only, the only significant difference that you see in these two pictures is that in one case it's public Azure, and in the other case it's private, and it's got a bunch of system center stuff on it. Um, very simplified way to think about it. Again, if you want to go deeper on that topic, I suggest you hit uh, Mark and Bradley's session, or uh, actually it's not Bradley, but Mark's session tomorrow morning. And with that, I think I need to wrap up because I'm being given the you're out of time signal. Any other questions before we go? Yeah. So the question is, after I, as a self-service user, have created that VM, what else can I do to it? Um, you can do anything that the portal exposes. Right now, the portal doesn't have a lot of exposure of being able to change the shape of that VM. Um, but, but in theory, yeah, there's no reason you couldn't. It, it does some of that. I mean, yeah, he'll, again, he'll kind of take you on a tour of, of that tomorrow if you want to see that work. All right, uh, thanks. I tell you what, can you guys, can we do up here questions and thank you all for coming.